Good morning, everybody. I'm Caleb. I'm on the preaching team here, and we are jumping into the second week of this series called Your Future Self Will Thank You. And this is a crazy time to be thinking about the future. Things have changed so much. And we're also thinking about God's will. And God's will has been a tricky thing to try to understand in this season as well. Uh, This is also the week of Thanksgiving. And uh, some of us may have very different plans than we would have expected to have. I mean, the stores aren't going to be open on Friday. What are we going to do to fill that day? So last week, Dirk started us off by talking about God's will and talking about sort of two pillars, if you will. God's sovereign will, who God is and what he's about. God's moral will, so sort of what God has said is right and wrong. And then taking those two pillars and kind of threading that needle to look at God's personal will. So what am I supposed to do? And what we're going to do this week is build upon that and sort of look at the how. So if last week was the what, this week is going to be the how. What we're looking at this week is that sovereign will, that moral will, how do we understand those? And what we heard last week is, is the Bible is a big part of that. It's one of the main places that we can learn and understand that. So in honor of Thanksgiving, last week we, we made the meal, and this week we're going we're gonna to eat the meal. We're going to talk about how to eat that meal, and specifically we're going to talk about three different ways to kind of go at this. So over the years, I've had a lot of different ways that I've sort of taken in the Bible. So as a kid, you may have uh, had the felt board with the characters and had things play out in front of you. Uh, When I was a youth, going to a youth group and having the hip youth pastor give me a relevant message while I was all hopped up on Mountain Dew. And then as becoming a young adult and adult and having to make sense of the Bible kind of without the safety net and try to figure out what the real world really is like when it comes to God's word. Recently, my small group went through a a teaching series from the Bible Project about how to understand and how to read the Bible. And and they used this particular term that's kind of stuck with me, and they talked about consuming the Bible or or reading the Bible as as sort of a devotional grab bag. So the devotional grab bag idea is basically going in and taking a verse or, or, or a small passage, pulling it out, you know, putting some personal application on it, and and having sort of a bite-sized nugget of, of wisdom, of, of motivation, of encouragement, and of teaching. And it's kind of gotten up in my business a bit, because now this is certainly better than not reading the Bible at all, but when it's the only way that I take in God's Word, I think I might be missing out a little bit. Because what happens when it comes to making decisions or God's will is I basically want God to parachute in, drop me a nugget, and then get out. I want him to solve my problem quick and get out of the way. Let me continue to do my thing. When, when, I, when I use my Bible, I mostly sort of want to flip it open and point somewhere and have that be the answer to be able to move on. Some of you may have had the, uh, the teen study Bible, if you will, and I want God to be the colorful page that pulls out the truths that I need for, for dealing with school. I, I want it neat and tidy and packaged up so that I can get my answer and move on. Now, yes, 2 Timothy tells us all Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Amen. Praise the Lord. But I really want the Bible to be more like those worksheets that we do in school that have the blanks on them, And you know you just have to find the answer in whatever you were reading to fill in the blank so you can turn in your worksheet and get on with things. When I'm looking at the future, when I'm looking at making decisions, again, I want God to sort of be more of my sidekick. And I want to take his word in more of this bite-sized approach. And I have this tendency, because of that, to make it just about me. I make myself the main character. I'm the hero. And I think to myself, how does this apply to me? What should I do? What do I think about this? And what that ends up doing is it puts me at the risk of making a wrong conclusion or looking at God's will only the way that I want to see it. Because there are a lot of things that, that the Bible doesn't explicitly speak to. It doesn't talk about social media. It doesn't talk about when you're 
looking in a new job, what sort of benefits package you should be looking for. It doesn't talk about whether you should buy or rent. And it certainly doesn't talk about some of the present realities that we're dealing with, like social distancing or or pandemic infections. Yes, there might be a little bit in Leviticus about uh, infectious diseases and lots of things about pus. Uh, But it, it leaves lots of things open to interpretation. And absolutely, we can infer and we can find guidance from the Bible with this sort of bite-sized nugget approach. But if I just make decisions based on those bits and pieces, when that's all that I do, I risk simply doing what I want and hoping that God will be the genie in the bottle and he'll just sort of help out. Or to use a baseball analogy, I want God to be the pitcher in the bullpen that when I load the bases, he comes in and gets me out of a jam. So how we're going to look through this this morning is is to go through an exercise using a story in the Bible of Gideon. And Gideon's one of the best-known characters in the book of Judges, and there's several snack-sized stories that we can use as examples. And there's lots of nuggets that we can pull out one at a time, but there's also some larger truths. And I hope that as we go through it, you'll see how those larger truths are more useful when it comes to seeing the big picture when we're thinking about the future or we're thinking about making decisions that are in front of us. So some quick background on the book of Judges. So the book of Judges comes after the book of Joshua, and the book of Joshua is about Joshua leading the people of Israel into the promised land. Now remember, they had had the opportunity to do this before under Moses, but they had gotten to the edge of that promised land, and they had been too afraid to go in. So God had sent them back out to wander for 40 more years. And again, remember before that, they were wandering around under Moses because God had brought them out of Egypt where the Israelites were in slavery. So when Joshua brings the people into the promised land, that land is not uninhabited. There are people living there. And God instructs his people to drive those out and to take possession of the land. And they do that, but they don't do it all the way. So the book of Judges ends up being sort of the up and down story of how things go when the Israelites do it, but not all the way. And things eventually descend into chaos. And there's this pattern in Judges where it starts with the Israelites forgetting about God, doing things their own way. Then they get themselves into a mess and another people come in and oppress them. And then God raises up a leader or a judge to help get them out of their jam. So I'm going to give you sort of the Caleb abridged version of Gideon, starting in Judges chapter 6. And it starts just like I said. Israel makes decisions to do things their own way. And eventually, God brings along a people called the Midianites who come in and oppress the Israelite people. And Gideon first enters the scene when an angel appears to him and says, Greetings, mighty warrior. But Gideon is not acting like a mighty warrior in that moment. He's actually hiding. He's sort of hiding in a wine press used for making wine, and he's trying to thresh wheat, and those things don't really go together. And he is not acting like a mighty warrior. Well, some conversation ensues. Gideon has some doubts that he voices, and they go back and forth. But eventually, Gideon gets on board. They make some food. They build an altar, and we're off to the races. So we could do a lot with just that nugget. We could talk about wine presses and threshing wheat. We could talk about the good stuff that the angel says. And we could put it all into a tidy package. And we could talk about what what we should do when we're enduring trials and call it a day. And and I even have a little bit of a tagline for you. We would call it, don't whine, press on. That uh, uh, that one's for free. And there's, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with what I've just gone through. This is God's word. It is living. It is active. It is sharper than any sword. But we can sell ourselves short with this bite-sized approach and we can miss the bigger picture, particularly when we're faced with a decision or an uncertainty or a struggle that, that maybe the Bible doesn't specifically speak to. So let's move on through Gideon and then we're going to loop back and try to tie it all together. So we have Gideon now on board and God comes to him and he says it's time to act. And the first thing God asks him to do is to go out and to tear down the idols and the altars that are in the community. Some are even in his own family's yard. And Gideon's scared. And he's not really into that idea. But he does it. He is obedient through fear, but he does it at night. 
And the folks wake up the next morning, and there's a little bit of stir about what's going on. But the Midianites then show up, so things change. So here's Gideon's chance to, to, to lead, to be that military leader that God, has, uh, that God has called him to be. But Gideon, again, he has some doubts. So Gideon goes through this exercise with God of, of taking a fleece and asking God to make it wet when the ground is dry or dry when the ground is wet to kind of just get a sense, God, are you really with me here? And those doubts probably only grew when he started to assemble his army. So Gideon started with a group of 32,000 men. And then after letting those go who were scared and then going through sort of two rounds of, of seeing how people drank water and having some leave, He's left with 300 men. But nevertheless, Gideon keeps going, and he heads out to the battle. And things really come to a climax the night before the battle, when God again comes to Gideon, and he says, Gideon, I need you to go take a listen in the Midianite camp. I want you to just go hear what's going on there. And God, I think, might, he must know that Gideon is going to be afraid or doubtful, because God straight up in the beginning tells him to do this and says, hey, you can take a buddy with you. So Gideon and his buddy go down to the Midianite camp and they listen and they hear the Midianites talking about dreams that they are having about how Gideon is going to be victorious. And it's really only then when Gideon hears the enemy talking about the victory that he is going to have that he finally gets it. And so he heads back to his group. He gets his team together and he heads out for a night attack taking trumpets and torches that are sort of hidden, and they smash and open those torches up to light. They blow their trumpets, and the Midianites freak out, and they turn on each other, and Gideon and his men don't have to do anything. They are victorious by default. Oh, my. There is so much here. This is so rich. We, if we want to look at understanding God's will through any of these, we would have so many options. We could do a sermon or a series on every one of these. We could talk about the dangers of idolatry. We could, we could talk about tearing down the idols that are in our lives. We could talk about asking God for a sign. Well, that one's been used both ways. Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? We could look at how, how God fights for us, and we don't need to be afraid because he is the victor in the end. And these are all fine and good things. But I'm still making this mostly about me with this grab bag approach, with these nuggets. And I'm creating the opportunity for me to just leave it there and miss the opportunity to actually get to know God better, to be able to see him better. And I get focused on the tree that's in front of me, and I forget about the forest. So let's go back through Gideon and dig a little bit deeper. But this time we're going to sort of flip in three different lenses to help focus what we see. So think about going to the eye doctor when they bring the big contraption up and they flip in the lenses one at a time. We're going to do three. And we're going to see the theme in the story of Gideon. We're going to see that theme connected to the rest of the Bible. And then we're going to see God himself. And now remember, this isn't just about knowing facts or knowing about God. This is about knowing God. And when we put these lenses on, it actually helps us see him and know him. And that's what we need when it comes to making decisions. So when we looked through Gideon, I tried to emphasize one pattern. There are others. I tried to emphasize one pattern to sort of be able to show you something that's similar throughout. So what we see when Gideon is faced with trials or or difficult challenges is this reaction of, uncertainty, fear, or doubt. When the angel comes, that's how he responds. When God asks him to do something, he hesitates. He needs reassurance. He needs uh, needs to be told it's going to be okay. So that's the first lens that we add. When we look at all of these Gideon stories together, we see how he reacts when faced with trials and faced with difficulty. We can flip in the second lens of taking this concept or this theme and seeing how, it's, how it exists in other places of the Bible as well. This is sort of the idea of hyperlinking to other places and other stories in the Bible. Gideon's response to the angel made me think a lot about when Abraham is approached by angels and, and is told he's going to have a son, even in very, very old age. 
he sort of responds again with this, I'm not sure. Remember Sarah laughing in the background? Or, or I thought about Moses at the burning bush when God calls him. He has all sorts of excuses. Oh, please not me. I don't speak well. Have you seen my brother Aaron? What are we going to do to make this work, God? If we go back to the very beginning, Adam and Eve, when they sin, they hide from God. Or the disciples, when they're with Jesus and he is taken, they run away, they scatter. And Peter, later that night, denies even knowing who Jesus is. So what we're starting to see by looking at this theme in Gideon and this theme in the Bible is we're starting to now see an illumination of of the human condition. We're seeing the way that our hearts are all bent. This is a universal problem of when I'm faced with a problem, I have doubts with God, I have fear, I have uncertainty. I can connect to me, but I'm still making it about me. And I've sort of tricked you here a little bit by these first two lenses, and I've left the last one out. And if we leave that one out, we put ourselves at the risk of, of tiptoeing right up to the edge, but still making this about ourselves. What's God's will for my life? And I do this at the expense of disregarding God. He's the third lens that really brings everything into focus. Last week, we heard from Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Someone else is the point of the scriptures. He's the main character. He's what we actually need. So if we go back to Gideon and this time we look for God, we see God and we see that as the lens from which we ultimately make the best decisions. When we look through Gideon, we see this pattern of behavior from God. We see what God is for and what God is against. We, de- we see displays of God's wisdom, true wisdom, and that's wisdom that and then I can align with so that choices are not made in my own power. In Gideon, we see God being faithful and he's gracious. He shows up even when it is undeserved. The whole story of Gideon starts with the Israelites doing their own thing. God doesn't have to show up, but he does. And when I'm in a mess or when I'm facing difficulty, a lot of times it's because I got myself into it. So I can see that God is with me even in that mess. God is there. God is present. And no matter what happens, he's still going to be with me. We see God being sovereign in Gideon. He's in control in the chaos. We see God being patient over and over with Gideon. Thank God for his patience with us. We see God being self-sufficient when it comes to the Midianites. God doesn't need Gideon's help to defeat them. And God is just, and in the end, he is victorious. We can do this same thing of seeing the theme of God in Gideon and extend that or hyperlink it to the rest of the Bible as well. We can connect what we've seen to other places. What are the characteristics of God that we've just gone through? His graciousness, his faithfulness, his patience that we see throughout the rest of the Bible. Now, I have to be honest, this is only going to happen when we're partaking of larger segments of Scripture than just those grab bag nuggets to make these kinds of connections. It's not going to be those nuggets alone. This is a lifetime's pursuit This is a lifestyle. This is going to take time. It's going to take effort. But I I truly believe that your future self will thank you for doing this. There's nothing your future self won't thank you for more than starting with God's word to be able to prepare ourselves for those real world dilemmas that come after us. Because when we filter decisions and looking for God's will through, through him, we have a much better chance of actually getting it right. So a few years ago, well, it's been more than a few years, the idea of WWJD was, uh, was quite common. It was T-shirts, bumper stickers, 
but it was really the bracelets, right? And uh, my wife was telling me that she held on to her bracelet for years after she stopped wearing it because she wasn't sure if it was like a sin to throw it away. What we're really asking here this morning is that question. When we're facing a decision, when we're facing the future, when we're looking for God's will, what would Jesus do? What would God do? And I think the question that I'm asking underneath that is, do we really know what he would do? The more I know God through his word, the more that we can actually answer the question of what would he do in this situation? What would he do in the situation that I'm facing? So, what are we going to do with all this? Let's be very practical. We have to start in God's word. There has never been a better time to start a new habit than now. Everything in life is mixed up. And this is an opportunity that you've never had before and may hopefully never have again to take the opportunity to start, a new ch- to start a new habit. If you have a phone in your hand or within reach, I would encourage you to set yourself an alarm for later today or tomorrow. Make it recurring, set two. Have something that's a reminder for you to get in God's word and to spend time getting to know him. If you have a physical Bible around you or in your hands, put it somewhere unusual so that you're going to see it and notice it and open it up. Put a sign on your mirror, put a note on the door, put it on the refrigerator, put something in your car if you use your car anymore. And then when you think and you spend that time, where should you start? Start right here with Judges 6 and 7. I intentionally did not put up any words or verses so that you have the opportunity to go back and to work through these chapters on your own and think about the things that we've that we've talked about here, to make the connections in that story, to think about the connections outside. So consider what's similar, what is different in what I'm reading, sort of that first lens. Look for those connections to the larger places in the biblical narrative. That's the second lens. If you have a study Bible, there are notes at the bottom or links on the side that might point you to somewhere else. If you're working through it with your family or with a roommate, Talk about, well, what does this make you think of? How could we see this somewhere else? And then the third one is don't forget, look for God and look for what it tells us about his character. If you need another practical example, Encounter has been going through a a How to Read the Bible series online, and you can see that. This last week it was Judges. Good timing. Use that as an on-ramp to get you into God's word to know him better. And remember, this is going to take time, this is going to take effort, and this is going to take practice. The book of Judges ends with a line that really sums it all up. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And that has been the case since the very beginning. Adam and Eve did what was right in their own eyes. And they took God off the throne and they made themselves the king. We saw it in Gideon here. We see it in our lives. I want to do what's right in my own eyes. I want to be the king. But we have a chance to change that because we have a king. We have God the Father. And we can do his will and do what is right in his eyes. And one of the best ways to be able to do that is to listen to what he's got to say. And it's again, it's also in the Bible that we have the example of Jesus, God's son. He was the only one who actually came and lived a life of full wisdom. He came and he died in our place. And he now is that connection between us and God. He's the one who paid the debt for our sins. And he's the one who serves as the high priest in the throne room of heaven. So we're going to close our time by practicing what we preach this morning. We're going to give God the final word. This is going to be our prayer, and this is going to be our benediction. benediction. I'm going to fight all the urge within me to try to say something afterwards or paraphrase or try to point something out. 
and I'm going to try to not put my words above his. We're going to believe that God is what we need. He is the one at work, and he is the one who is our only hope. So I invite you to close your eyes and to receive these words from Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 16 as our prayer. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen.